The universe is a vast place. It's a beautiful place. Anyone who's seen the Hubble Space Telescope pictures will know this. It's also a very subtle place. Until recently, we thought that we understood the universe. We thought we knew what matter was. We thought we kind of had it all wrapped up. Our theories would soon be complete. However, the universe had another plan for us. Our new instruments started to show that we didn't understand what 95% of the universe is made of. There's something we now called dark matter, something we now called dark energy, and it's called dark because we don't know what it is. Most mysterious things. So what I'll be talking about today is one of the big new observatories, the biggest radio telescope that probably, be, probably will be built in the next century. This is happening right here in Africa and also co-hosted in Australia, the Square Kilometre Array. This talk will focus both, both on the sort of lofty ambitions of the project, but also the potential of it. And in addition, kind of on the ground stuff that you need to do to make such a telescope happen. And all the other sort of spin-off activities that can happen around that. The SK is incredibly exciting for its science and its technology, but it's also exciting for the linkages, the conversations, the global nature, the international stature of the project. So this talk is up in space and on the ground. When you're building a radio telescope, you don't just start and build the world's biggest radio telescope. You first have to start a little bit smaller. Here in South Africa, we'd never built a, a reasonable size array before. We'd never built an array of radio telescopes before. So this is CAT7, the first array that we built. Um, became operational in about 2010, and it's doing really good science now. It was first an engineering prototype, now it's doing good science. Right now, we're rolling out Meerkat. Meerkat will be the world's best instrument, the most sensitive instrument in the frequency bands that it operates in. The dish on the left-hand side is a 15-meter a dish. I've got the sides the right way around. 15-meter uh, dish. It's fully steerable, can point all around the sky. And that's the first one that's been constructed. We're busy now testing that out. The new signals are appearing, coming from that dish, and the results look incredibly good. Uh, we're expecting sensitivities well beyond our specifications, which is fantastic for the kind of science you can do with the thing. There's going to be 64 of these dishes, and the picture on the right-hand side shows the, the core of the array. Each of those white little dots there is where one of these antennas will go. So in about 2016, early 2017, we should see the full array deployed in the Karoo. It's about 700 kilometers away from here. SK2, when it's finally built in the final stages, phase two, will be something like 2,500 dishes in, in Africa. So the core in the Karoo, you can imagine what this, this scene will be like if you travel up to the Karoo around about 2028, 20, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> it's going to take a while. It's a big project uh, to, get, to get to phase two. But just a sea of dishes. Imagine this whole thing working in, in unison, tracking the sky, moving to different sources, um, and then the amazingly faint signals coming in from space, kind of trickling in, buried in, underneath the system noise, and gradually getting integrated up to be something that you can see, like an identifiable picture or a, a signal from a pulsar or some unknown transient due to an unknown kind of event in the universe. This is what it will look like in Africa, and this is where you can see I get excited about the possibilities of the SK and what it means for African development. All those white dots there are stations in Africa where the SK will be built. So this is going to provide tremendous opportunities for scientific collaboration, government collaboration, business collaboration, all kinds of things where the humanity is really getting together here to solve a common problem and addressing some of the deepest problems, deepest questions of physics. A little bit of the science of the SK. This is an optical picture taken of a galaxy called Centaurus A. It's uh, something like uh, 13 million light years away, which means light has taken 13 million years to get to us. That's what it looks like in optical light. If you add the radio picture to that and some X-ray as well, you'll see this big uh, double jet kind of coming out of the middle of the galaxy, which points to a supermassive black hole in the middle there. The only thing that we know of that can generate a jet of that scale, which is about a million light years across. Um, and with the, the energies coming out of there and the amount of matter that's being um, accelerated up to those energies, around about half the speed of light in the inner parts of that core is a black hole. And this black hole in the middle here is estimated to have a mass 55 uh, million times the mass of our sun. So that's a fairly, fairly big object. 
but fairly uh, compressed in space as well. Uh, speaking of black holes, if you haven't seen the, the movie uh, Interstellar, which has just come out in South Africa recently, go and see it. As a techie, it's fantastic. If you're nerdy, geeky, <laughs> you don't even have to take your, your kids. <laughs> <laughs> An important part of the science of um, SK is obse observing pulsars. And this is particularly something that we'll be doing here in South Africa with the Meerkat and SK-1. Um, this is a, a schematic of a double pulsar system which was fairly recently discovered. And it's a really interesting system because as these uh, objects uh, rotate around each other, they happen to be in a plane where they're kind of in line with where we are looking from Earth. In addition, these objects are spinning around an axis and those beams act like a lighthouse. These things spin pretty fast, some of them up to almost a thousand times a second. And that sort of white object in the middle is, represents the, the kind of core of the neutron star which is something about the size of, of Cape Town, a, uh, about a 20 kilometer size object, a mass of about one and a half times the mass of the sun, and spinning up to a thousand times a second and somehow not falling apart. Can you just imagine what that, the forces must be involved in that, that kind of thing, and the kind of physics you could test with an object like this? The SK will has, has a whole range of kind of interesting science. With radio telescopes, you make pictures, you can measure timing signals, uh, you can measure the, the dark energy expansion of the universe, uh, where did life come from, uh, magnetism, all kinds of interesting things. Was Einstein right? We've tested uh, general relativity to quite high, high degrees of accuracy, but we always want to go a little bit further and find where does it deviate? Have we got the theory right? You know, how do we tie up um, relativity with quantum mechanics? There's all kinds of interesting questions we haven't solved. As I said, unfortunately, 95% of the universe at the moment, we don't know what it is. This is the, uh, what the SK will look like in Africa and Australia. Um, up on the top left, we've got the dish array in, in Africa. On the, on the bottom left, the low frequency dipole array in Australia that's operating at lower frequencies. So these are different kinds of antennas. And then perhaps something in the future on the right hand side in Africa, uh, the mid frequency aperture array where you can electronically steer beams around the sky. No moving parts in that either. So that's all new technology and will be very interesting to see how it develops and whether it reaches the kind of sensitivities that we need for radio astronomy. The timeline of the project, well, it's going to run on for quite a long time. At the moment, we're working on the design phase, which is um, running until 2016. So it's a kind of a three-year period where there's international consortia around the world working on the design of the SKA. A number of South African companies are involved as well, I'm, I'm happy to say. Um, thereafter, there's going to be a construction phase for SKA phase one, and then there'll be design and construction for SKA phase two thereafter. So SKA phase one should be built in about 2021 or so, and SKA phase two thereafter. At the moment, we're going through something called rebaselining, which is to really fit our ambitions into the available capital budget for the first phase of the project. There's many different countries involved. You can see some of them up on the slide there. In fact, all of them currently that are involved. And we're hoping that uh, a couple more countries will still join join the SKA in the future. Something about the data side, because this is a big data conference. SKA and uh, big data, they're really kind of joined at the hip. Unless we solve big data problems with the SKA, we're not going to be able to do the science. So this shows array an array telescope to give you some idea of how they work. What you do is you have a sort of a fiber optic cable coming from each of the antennas. This is the very large array in America, currently the, the premier instrument. You have fiber optic cable with a data stream coming into a very big computer, a first stage computer, which we call the correlator or the beam former. And what that does, that, that block there, that big blue block, it either compares each signal from each dish with every other dish, or else it adds them all together. So two different kind of modes of operation, depending on what kind of science you want to do. Thereafter, the data rate is reduced after that first stage. It goes into something called the science data processor, which, which is typically our more kind of traditional high performance computing with uh, clusters of machines and, and uh, various architectures, GPUs and things involved. And thereafter, it goes out to the scientists. And people are looking at models for getting the data to the scientists, for allowing, allowing them to reprocess the data. And this is typical things like um, cloud infrastructures, um, supercomputing centers in different countries, big networks in between them, research networks, etc. So just to show you sort of some of the data rates there, um, so for Meerkat, that first stage going into the correlator, each, each um, antenna produces 32 gigabits per second. So that's 32 times your office network kind of coming out of each antenna. There's 64 antennas, so that's two terabits per second if you add that all up. Um, which gives you about um, seven, in terms of data, per, um, amount of data per day, 700,032 um, gigabyte um, iPods or iPads, if you like, um, 
per day, uh, amount of data coming out of Meerkat. As you go to SK1, uh, that, that number goes up, 17 million 32 gigabyte um, iPod, iPods per day. And uh, for SK2, it's 1.8 billion. But those numbers are so large, as we heard earlier, people don't even know what a million seconds is. So maybe we should uh, not fuss when we get to those large scales at this point. On the computing side, it's, it's, we're talking about teraflops, um, hundreds of teraflops for Meerkat, um, petaflops for SK1 mid, and, and exaflops for SK2. Uh, nobody's built an exaflop computer yet, so uh, this is still a way off, luckily, so we've got time on our side. <laughs> a big important part of this is power consumption as well. Um, fortunately, some of the devices that we have these days are, are tablets and things. They're really um, focusing on portability and, and hence power efficiency. And some of that technology we're actually taking into the telescope now as well. We're seeing can we do massive processing using kind of tablet technology, thousands of tablet chips, for example. So on the innovation side, um, this is one of my colleagues. He, he's the one on the right, by the way, just so you <laughs> <laughs> What he's building is this, this thing called the Roach Board, and he has a team that he works with. Uh, this is that first stage of computing, the correlator beamformer. Um, the, the data rates going into this board are very high, uh, very simple computation, but it's really optimized for, for high bandwidth kind of um, operations. Other parts of our innovation extend the, 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 the telescope and the sort of interest in the telescope into things like big data programs. So one of the things we're trying to work on with government is a national big data program, and it's really focused on skills development in the first instance, but also linking up um, government, um, industry, and academia in interesting ways and, and kind of providing those, those links. Radio astronomy and, um, and in fact, many of the, the research sciences in, in South Africa, including the social sciences, are very collaborative in nature. We don't have to sit in silos anymore, and uh, there aren't enough skills ready to go around, so we have to grow the skills. So this is a program we're working on with, with government. Um, it, we think it should be funded quite soon. The idea is to have these clusters of universities in the different parts of the country. Remember, we're a national program. We're not just the Western Cape. And um, we'll see what comes out of this. It's sort of at the top is the, the, the cyber infrastructure of the country, which includes high performance computing, the networking, the storage, et cetera, in particular the skills too. A more local initiative is this high performance computing center. We do need uh, high performance computing in um, Cape Town to, to service the SKA. But in, in addition, the universities want increased capacity and business needs places to run their stuff, et cetera. Um, and the center for high performance computing is also located here. So we're working on a, on a possibly a big new facility here, um, 16 megawatts or so of power in the first phase, and a fairly green facility. So a model for kind of engaging with, with, uh, with government, and I see there hasn't been a lot of kind of government talk here, but we're very connected with government because we're a government-funded project. Government really is keen to hear from industry. When we meet with them, we, we meet with the Western Cape government and other, other provincial governments, et cetera, they, want, they, they need the smart solutions. They, can, they see their tourist problems, they see the health problems, they see all kinds of social issues, and it's really, they, they're kind of crying out for help in a way. So I would encourage anybody that runs a kind of small business here to try and find ways to get in touch with the government, try and get a hold of seed funding, they've got various pots of money and things, and a lot can be done. This is a model for developing a, a, a national health platform where the data is, so belongs to the patient, but there's interoperability amongst uh, many different health providers. The core of it is in the middle there is funded by public funding to get it going, maybe with industry participation as well. And then industry can build services on top of that layer. So if you've got a decent platform that's spread around the country, you can really build a lot of very interesting commercial services on top. So it's a model that could sustain itself. You have a kind of not-for-profit in the middle, um, open source kind of technology, and, and then commercial services around it. And this is the kind of thing I think we'd like to promote with the SKA. So now a little bit of a digression. Uh, this is a kind of a, a big data, but a, an on the ground kind of social innovation. So please just bear with me a little bit. Okay, so this is my bicycle. It's a little bit geeky, I must, must admit. Uh, a little bit unconventional. Um, it's called a recumbent bicycle. They've actually been around a very long time. Um, it attracts a lot of comments. I get a lot of head turning. People go, whoa, what's that? P particularly certain segments of the population go, whoa, or <laughs> <laughs> nice bike, <laughs> or something. <laughs> I heard it awesome the other day, which is great. But my best comment was in the August 2, I was like struggling up a uh, Seikobosi Hill towards the end of it. 
and I got, um, Mommy, is that man paralyzed? <laughs> <laughs> Which I really thought was quite funny at the time. Anyway, so from the more serious thinkers like the other bikers out there, they say, but why are you riding this strange machine? Well, there's a few simple reasons, but it's, it's fast, it's comfortable, and it's fun. So I wanted to extend this idea out a bit and say, what if we had a, a team of these, these things? We had a, a showcase recumbent team, and we had like seven riders, and we zoomed around Cape Town. It would be super fast, because you could all kind of slipstream each other down at that low level, and it would promote out-of-the-box thinking, and why does everyone ride normal bikes if you can be more efficient this way, and all this kind of stuff. This was my grand plan, and I've been sort of throwing this idea for around, around for a while. And I still think it would be a really cool thing to do. But the universe had another idea. So one day I was, I was involved in my recumbent uh, working on uh, going around Simonstown on this thing to raise money for charity for the, the Ben uh, Cycling Bicycling Empowerment Network, a very good charity that provides cycling into townships and empowers people with, with cycle transport. And at the end of the whole thing, in the spot prizes at the end of the prize giving, I won this bike. <laughs> So this is the universe's plan. So I kind of looked at this thing and thought, well, okay, my idea was the one on, on the right. This is what I've got, uh, this sort of delivery bike. So anyway, this got me thinking a little bit. And I thought this is really a, a gift from the universe. And it, it's related to this idea of gift meals. And the sort of basic principle is that when you're out there on the streets, you see people at the robots, even just outside this convention center. South Africa has people that have food, people that have no food, people that have jobs, no jobs, money, no money, etc. And they're all living in quite close proximity to each other. There's often stuff that goes to waste as well. So there's really no excuse for, for people having to starve. And there's also more than enough food to go around if only we can find a way to distribute it. And that's where the bike comes in. So this gift meals thing is a sort of just an idea I'm, I'm throwing out there. We're actually actively working on this now. We're trying to get this rolled out in Cape Town next year. It's a bit like the Uber taxi service. Uh, you can see the green things on the map there are where the meals are available. So someone has a cell phone. They say, I've got a meal available. We have this app you download. Come collect three meals. A guy on a bicycle arrives, um, takes the meals to where they need it in the Red Crosses. It's really that simple. It's a very, very simple concept. And it's not just a matter of kind of throwing these leftovers in these disposable boxes, uh, biodegradable boxes. It's actually, it's a proper meal that you're trying to give to somebody. It's a gift. So it's as much to, as benefit uh, to the giver as to the person receiving. That's the concept of this thing. So look out for this thing. It'll be, uh, we're trying to launch it next year and we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Okay, so just to finish off, on the skills side, we really do need a lot of uh, skills development to be done to support radio telescopes, to support the big projects, but also to support these kind of on-the-ground initiatives, things that are coming out of these nice conversations that we have, these sort of social initi initiatives that are possible. So here we're building radio telescopes. It involves bricklaying. It involves designing expensive and complicated receivers. Uh, we have a very good, a big and, and successful skills program with a pipeline um, in, in our... Um, in our project, and we're very pleased to hear that Mammoth BI is also starting this idea of the bursary. I think that's an excellent initiative. Mm. These are some of the future data scientists in the town of Carnarvon. You've probably even, never even heard of Carnarvon. It's a tiny little town closest to our telescope. Um, some new initiatives there. This one in particular, the Community Knowledge Center, they really, uh, it's been very successful. They're actually training up these youths uh, who haven't had access to the internet before, but not just giving them internet access, but actually doing them online courses, training, learning IT, learning various things. So very successful. And we hope to see this rolled out around the country. So just to close off, SK and big data, it really is a big opportunity. It's a big opportunity not only for the science and the technology, but all the kind of spin-off activities that I've talked about. And I'd really like to stress the social stuff. You know, we, we had that band earlier that was playing that song and they had that, that rather moving movie of, of people in the war and all that. How about if you used your, your predictive analytics to predict when a war might happen and then you could take steps to avoid that? How about that? That's a real challenge. How about if we predicted where food would be needed and we could act in advance to get that food to the right place? How about if we predicted where medicines would be needed? How about if we predicted where Ebola would happen before it even happened? and made steps to avoid it. That's the kind of analytics I think we should really focus on. There's a lot of business applications as well, and of course we need sustainable businesses, we need thriving businesses, but there's so much we can do with big data. Big data is already happening, and it's not all rocket science, as I've said. There's SKA, there's all kinds of things, but it's also societal stuff that can be done, and I really think we should focus on that. 
The technology, as we've heard today, is already fantastic. There's a lot of things we can do. It's actually the people and the problems and the applications that we need to kind of tie that all together. It's about skills. So finally, collaborate. Big data is big, and there's space for everyone. There's space for a lot of businesses, new businesses. We hope to see a lot of new businesses. This hall should be full next year, I hope. It's already pretty full, but next year, let's try and fill it. Be bold what you aim for. Aim for the stars. We didn't think we'd get the SK. Who would have thought that the SK could come to Africa? There was no chance. Yet with step by step, doing on the ground stuff, building what we could, we've done it. It's coming. So I'd like to uh, leave you with those challenges and say, let's make money, let's be thriving as an economy, but let's also fix some of the social ills and ad address things where we can at the ground level. It doesn't have to be from government. It can be a private citizen's initiative to get something going. Thank you.